All righty, here we are. This is the live show of the Exceptionally Irresistible Show. This is so exciting. You know, I am your co-host, Yermi Kirkis, and Baruch, introduce yourself. I am your other co-host, Baruch <laughs> Dubrow. I almost said Yermi Kirkis there, so I, I'm glad I got the script right in my head. Um, we're really excited to be here. We got an amazing show ahead of us. You already saw a little glimpse of who we're going to be interviewing today and who we're going to be talking to and learning from. Should we jump straight into the bio? I think we should. So okay, let's awesome. introduce, um, you know, Luis Fernandez. He's sitting right now in the, in the, you know, in the, I don't know what you call it, green room, back room. Green room. Um, it's the green right? room. Sounds more official. Yeah. So if you just want to give us a little bit of who uh, Fer- uh, Lewis is, and I will invite him in. Definitely. So, I got to meet Lewis for a little bit before this show. I know Jeremy's known him a little bit longer. Already, I'm just like gushing with excitement. I don't know if you can tell, but I am going to be introducing um, Lewis Fernandez for the very first live show. Lewis is a husband and father of three beautiful kids. He's surely blessed. He spent seven years as an army officer deploying twice and seeing fierce combat in Afghanistan. So first of all, I'm going to interrupt the bio here to say thank you so much for your service. Um, After the military, he spent some years working in a Fortune 100 before realizing that he had a knack and a passion for business. In the midst of the pandemic, Lewis embarked on his entrepreneurial journey, helping other businesses reduce costs to thrive in tough economic environments. True to his deliver results first nature, his company only gets paid if they save you money. He is also an author of a five-star rated leadership book called Keep on Leading, and runs his own podcast called Built with Grit. There is so much going on there. There is so much that is exceptional there. I, I don't know even where to start, but you know what? You're going to bring him in. because I'm, I'm bringing him in. The hour. Absolutely. Here he is, the man of the hour. Woo! What is up, y'all? Uh, boy, you, you guys should know how to make a girl feel special. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Lewis, I never knew something about you. <laughs> 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 that's wow. outstanding man thank you guys so much uh thank you for you know i you didn't mention it but you should that there was a pre-show to this uh where you guys talked about you know yourselves and and what it means to be exceptional and what it means to be irresistible right. um and and that's a solid 20 minutes right it was about 20 20 so yep. minutes um yeah. that yep. folks should definitely check out because i think we're going to riff off a lot of what you guys have already discussed right 100 percent. absolutely yeah, yeah mm-hmm. exactly that and you know, I met Lewis on on a platform, um, you know, called Bizfluence, um, same place where I met Baruch. And I think this is so beautiful to see, you know, like minded people coming together on a platform, collaborating and coming together and having this kind of discussion, which is really, really important in today's day and age. Um, exactly like what Lewis was saying is that we had a 20 minute conversation, Baruch and I. Um, earlier today on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from. But the idea here is to continue that discussion, is to really invite um, the audience to take the next step and really listen um, to other business professionals. Now, something that stood out to me, and Lewis is my guest in this situation, um, you know, what stood out to me from Lewis is that right away from, you know, from a military background, from, you know, from a leadership background, Lewis right away showed this exceptional and this irresistible nature to him. In fact, he actually invited me to his podcast Mm -hmm. and we spoke and it was just like mind blowing. I walked away from that, you know, I I grew from it. So, I mean, I don't know what other people heard from it and what other people grew from it, but I did. Um, and that's what encouraged me to bring out Lewis and just to talk to him more about, you know, share with us a little bit first, you know, your background about, you know, the military, how did you get there? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what were lessons you learned? Uh, sure. So I'm actually, I'm a, I'm a child of two uh, Cuban refugees. So so both of my parents were born in Cuba. Um, they actually met in the United States. And then, um, so I'm a uh, natural born citizen here in the United States. Uh, But both my parents were born overseas. Um, We spoke Spanish in the home. I learned English in school. uh, And um, my dad actually uh, joined the military. He was in the U.S. Navy, a naval officer. So I grew up, um, I actually, 
this this month I celebrated a unique anniversary in that um, it's four years and one month. So uh, here in Tucson, Arizona. So this is the longest I have ever wow. lived in any one place. Wow. Um, in my whole life. Uh, and I'm about to turn 40, by the way. Wow. Uh, so uh, I, 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 I've lost track now. I, um, something like three continents and seven countries and 30 something addresses or something like that. I, I, I can't remember. Oh, anymore. Um, so, you know, always moved around. Um, and, uh, uh, as far as joining the military, um, it, it was, that, it was September 11th. So I, I was in college. Wow. Uh, I was a sophomore in college on September 11th. And, um, a, I actually almost dropped out. Um, and my dad tried to convince me cause I was going to drop out and enlist in the army. <laughs> uh, and my dad tried to talk me out of the military and, and he was unsuccessful. And, uh, you know, basically everyone in my family tried. And then my grandfather called me, uh, and my grandfather told me the story of how he brought his family, which is my, my mom's dad. Um, and, and my mom was five years old at the time. He had four kids and, you know, um, pumping gas, delivering newspapers, um, you know, driving a delivery truck, do whatever he could um, mm -hmm. to, you know, to feed his family and actually uh, put my grandmother through through college. Um, and so he tells me the story. And I, I mean, I had heard it who knows how many times by then, but from all the different perspectives of everyone in the family. But, you know, when the pater familias, when, when Abuelo wants to tell a story, he gets to tell the story, <laughs> right? And uh, sure. so you listen again. And um, and he finished the story. He says, "Yeah, do you know why I told you that story?" I was like, "No, why? Why, why did you tell me the story?" Because uh, you know, this conversation was in Spanish, of course. Um, and he says, uh, "Because you owe me, me debes." Uh, and that, oof, you know, even now, telling it twenty years later, like I got goosebumps. Uh, wow. wow, thinking about it, you know. And he's um, he said, "You know, I didn't know you, but I did it for you. So um, get your degree, and then you can go to the army." So that's what I did. Um, wow. and, uh, yeah, so I, I, graduated, uh, I graduated college in May of 2004, started, uh, in the army in June. Um, so just six days later on June 6, 2004 was my first day as a second Lieutenant in, in the U S army, which was the 60th anniversary of D-Day also happened to be a Sunday. Um, so as a Christian has, you know, kind of like additional significance there. Right. Um, and uh, by March of the following year, I was in Afghanistan. So uh, it was quick, quick training. And, you know, now you're leading 40 guys in combat. Congratulations. Wow. wow. <laughs> That's absolutely incredible. And, and you know, it's, you know, the, the topic is being exceptional, exceptionally and irresistible and being becoming exceptionally irresistible. And one of the things that always stands out to me is that when any, whenever anybody has a chance to choose a certain life or a certain way of living, that already, to me, is exceptional. You know, I, I for, for the, the Jewish circle, I oftentimes use the example that my father was not always religious. Um, he chose to become religious in, around his 20s, whereas I was born into being mm -hmm. religious. Um, so anytime I see somebody choosing something, whether it's, it's college or whether it's the military, but they're choosing a certain way of life, to me, that already sets you, know, sets you apart as being exceptional because this is... It's no longer doing what I have to do. And as I define exceptional, exceptional is one more than, than what everybody else is doing or one more than what you're used to. So it's incredible to see that it, it wasn't just my father was in the military, so I joined the military. This was th There was that, that conscious decision to go to college first and then join the military. And you didn't necessarily have to go to the military after college, but you did anyway. So that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that with us. It, it was uh, it was a fun ride. It was a defining moment for me. You know, I, I had, uh, you know, I, I finished college, but my mind was on the army. It was not on my studies, you know. Yeah. Um, so technically I got a degree. I switched. I was, um, I was an engineering major and then I switched to history because uh, mm. I thought that would be easier. I was wrong about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> history is a lot more time consuming. There's a lot of pre-law folks in there. Anybody who's a lawyer. Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, that went through that knows that, you know, you're reading thousands of pages and writing and um, but that was that was my thing. And, and, and really, my focus was, you know, I knew I was going to be going to combat and um, learning as much as I could about warfare. Um, so 
yeah, I mean, I technically, I did get my degree, um, but uh, but it was more of a degree in, in, in being an army officer than it was in, in history, right? Right. Um, so actually, let's, you know, let's take that leap. And, you know, we are talking about, um, so this week's topic is about why are why exceptionally irresistible basically you know this whole show is called exceptionally irresistible um in the you know in the podcast that we that we launched this morning um bark and i shared the story of how this podcast came to be how we came up with the name and essentially we we shared you know bark and i shared our excuse me our thoughts about what exceptional means what irresistible means and why it's important to be exceptionally irresistible. Um, and this is really a collaboration of two expertise where Baruch is the exceptional um, expert. He helps people become more exceptional. Um, I help people become more irresistible. And so, you know, really just taking that conversation to the next level, making it deeper in a sense. Um, somebody with your background, Lewis, I have a question for you. When you hear the word exceptional what you know what comes to your mind so the question is what is exceptional in your opinion yeah uh so i, I actually i took some notes uh when i was listening this morning um uh to to your guys this thing and, and i kind of you know jumbled around a little bit about what you were saying and thinking about you know what is my uh unique take on this uh if you will mm -hmm. um and something that i've learned kind of going through life is that the harder something is, the more valuable it becomes, mm. um, which, um, you, you know, like uh, somebody who somebody who wins the lottery won't value the, the, that money as much as the, the guy who um, I interviewed a man yesterday who built uh, was a car salesman and now owns 17 dealerships. Wow. OK. Um, you know, and, and and when I talk to you, I mean, you, you know, built with grit. We're we're talking about people that have gone through the gritty stuff, and um, you know, I look around me, and you know, I look at uh, like marriages that have lasted fifty years, right? Uh, that's work. That's not. I mean, it's not. It's not. It was. That's that's. A, they they worked on that, you know, yeah. to make it happen, and um, you know, those are things that that we ascribe value to, and have found, you know, in the military, we have a lot of awards and badges and things, and um, the ones that I value the most that I, that I still talk about were the ones that were the hardest to get. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, what is it, what does it mean to be exceptional to me is, is, is someone who's willing to take on and do the hard things and, and be uncomfortable. Um, and, and that's really where growth is. Right. Uh, I, I think of like that, that, that movie Wally, -E, right. And so like everything was, was really easy and, and people got soft, you know, mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, the, the, if you look at kind of like the most elite soldiers, um, they do the hardest things, right? And it's it's really hard to get there. And then if you talk to those guys that like made it through when they're there, they're like, oh, that's when it starts. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. know, I, I have talked to professional athletes that say the same thing, like, oh, high school was fun and, and college was, you know, it seemed like it was a little bit of a jump. But when I got to the pros, I mean, it just... <sighs> And for many of us, we think like, oh, there's the finish line. Mm -hmm. um, and, and no, it, it, it's, you know, this is when the real work and this is what's what's hard to do. And, and how do you set yourself apart? Um, of course, you've got some natural talent, but beyond the natural talent, there's a lot of people with natural talent that don't make it because they're not willing to do mm -hmm. the hard thing and the hard work. And um, I saw the, the the Michael Jordan thing and you you hear about his work ethic and the guy who just like, you know, he was the best in the world because you know, he outworked everybody. Right. So right. what is exceptional? I think exceptional is a byproduct in my, in my opinion is a byproduct of, um, of, of that effort. Right. It's, it's what you get at the end of the effort. Wow. So wow. can I ask a question then? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, 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 there's a lot of people out there and I'm obviously talking about myself or I think I'm supposed to be asking for a friend, right? There are times <laughs> when, <laughs> when, <laughs> It, it, it's difficult to put in the effort, right? Yeah, Even though sure. you see the end result, mm. but it, it's hard to put in the effort. And you know that strength and growth comes from doing the challenge and facing the challenge. 
what can you say to, to the people, whether they're business owners or their parents or, or whatever it may be, any, anybody in any industry or any area of life, they know what needs to get done. They need to do the work. But how do they, they tap into that exceptionalism, so to speak? How do they tap into um, hmm. pushing forward in, in through the thick of it, into the mud of it? I mean, you're, you're coming from military experience. You're coming from business experience. You launched a business, from my understanding, during COVID. When everything yeah. was shutting down, you're diving into it. Yeah. What, what was the mindset look like there? Well, you know, how did you get there? <clears throat> um, well, so like my general advice would be to understand your reasoning and your why. Uh, right. you know, what, what is that driving force behind? You know, when you first embark on something and you're really excited to do it, um, maybe even then write down why I want to do this. Wh what's exciting about it? Because there's going to reach a time that it gets difficult and there's a slug, right? That you just kind of got to push through. And, you know, again, and as I talk to more and more business owners, I always find that like they hit their moment right at like, it, it's, it's right at that. Do I quit today? And then mm -hmm. they're, they're about to throw in the towel and the next day they get a phone call. Right. Because but you don't realize, right. like if you go to build a building, um, it will be months before you see a wall, right? Because you've got to flat the ground and you got to cut the trees and then you got to take all those roots out and then you got to, you know, level it and grade it and grade it some more and then level it again. And then, you know, it rains. So you got to stop, right? So there's a whole lot of time before the structure starts coming up. And then once the structure starts coming up, it goes up quickly, right? right. Um, so right. understanding that why, because you're going to hit that slug. You're going to be, I've been at this for months I don't have a single wall up yet. And I, mm. I can't even, all I've done is, is get the ground ready. I haven't gone anywhere. I haven't done anything. I haven't accomplished anything yet. Um, and, uh, you know, understand what's that? Why is that, is that reason still uh, effective? Is it, is it right. still apply, you know, right. and, um, and stick with it for that, you know? Um, that, I mean, that's what got me through Ranger school is that I knew that if I wanted to be in, uh, I knew that if I, I knew I was going to combat, right. And I decided that I wanted to go to combat with the best. Um, and so you had to prove yourself, right. So uh, if I was going to go to the front lines and, and, and do this thing, I had to make it through this. Um, and there were guys that I met in ranger school that, that they had that resolve. I mean, they just decided that I will die before I quit. Yeah. Right? And I was, I was not the fastest. I'm not the tallest. I'm not the strongest. I'm not the smartest guy. But I beat out guys that are bigger, faster, stronger, uh, that have the look, you know, and, and, and they work out every day, whatever, because I wouldn't quit. Right. And, and I just had that mentality, like, I'm going to make it, you know, wow. um, and you able to outwork those people because I had, a, you know, in my mind, I had a strong why I stuck to that. I kept reaching for that when times got tough and that got me through it. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of forgot where the question was and I hope that I answered it. You know, no, that, that is, <laughs> you that totally is. did. Yeah. I, and actually, there is, why did we skip over the fact that you were in range? Like, you weren't just in the arm, you were like a ranger. Like, why was that not something that was okay? <laughs> well, I, I graduated range, for the people that are in the army, they understand there's a difference. I graduated ranger school, I was not in the ranger regiment. Okay, mm -hmm. so, I, I, wore, I wore a ranger tab, but I, I, I wasn't in regiment. Okay, I, I my military knowledge is different. So. <laughs> So there is actually a comment from LinkedIn. Unfortunately, we cannot see who is the one who commented. Um, but, you know, the LinkedIn user basically says, you know, thank you for your credible ethic. That is that is very powerful. And I do think that, you know, the ethic and that work, you know, that work ethic and that work and just in general, your mindset um, is what is what essentially drives you to that exceptionalism is what drives you to being exceptional. Not everybody has that level of ethic or not everybody has that level of mindset or whatever it is, you know? And it's it really speaks to your, you know, to your uh, podcast and, and to your book about, um, you know, about, about really leading with that grit. It's going with, you know, having that grit and that's that push and that's that drive, you know, um, which is, which is, you know, something that I was attracted to you and when I was, you know, meeting you and when I, when I accepted to come onto your show, um, there was this drive and there was this something that pulled me in with your energy, you know, and that, that is something that I want to talk about where I personally, I call that irresistible, but, you know, 
I think everybody else heard what my thoughts are about Irresistible, what Bark's thoughts are about Irresistible. And, you know, I'm curious, I never asked you, what are your thoughts about, you know, being Irresistible? What is that to you? Um, so this one, I think, uh, and again, I've had all day to think about it because it's not a new question, right? Like I knew this one was coming. Uh, and, and as I was listening to the podcast, like, okay, so what are, you know, how would I uh, define this, right? And, and, and I spent some time thinking about the people that I wanted to be around. Um, mm. and, and Jeremy, that's one of the things, you, you know, like people want to be around you. I think you mentioned that. And that was sort of the trick around me is thinking, what was it about these people that made me want to spend time with them? Um, you know, because my circle is pretty small of like the people that I hang out with, on, like kind of on a regular basis. And, you know, right. you know, I have a lot of acquaintances, a lot of acquaintances and like five friends. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and I don't know how everybody, um, how everybody else kind of uh, approaches this, but what makes me want to be around somebody um, or just give up my time to be with them. Right. Because, uh, if I'm giving time to someone, it's, I'm, you know, there's a, there's an opportunity cost, right. Um, right. so my kids are downstairs and they're, you know, they're doing stuff and, 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 and I'm not spending time with them I'm spending time with you guys. Like, what is that? What is it that makes, uh, sure. What I have found is that people that attract others, that folks want to spend time with them, they have a way of actually, pushing the spotlight away from themselves mm. uh, and and they share the glory they share the energy they um, they they put the spotlight on others especially if it's always on them that they have a tendency to like no let me let me turn this on someone else and that also it, it kind of pushes into what makes that those people tend to be great leaders as well um, right. because they have a mindset of thinking about others and and recognize that you know kind of like if I can make this, the, the tide rise, you know, all the boats go up too, and, and we're all more successful. Um, you know, there's a joke in the military, we call it the spotlight ranger. Uh, and that's the guy who only does the good thing when the spotlight's on him. Gotcha. Uh, right. And, and so there's a lot of peer evaluations that go mm -hmm. in, and it's actually a, 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 your peer evals, um, you have to have good evaluations just to graduate. Wow. Uh, and, and part of that is that, you know, your peers are going to see you, at your worst, at the, at the absolute worst, when I'm tired and, you know, it's mile 13 of, I, you don't even know, actually, because you don't have a watch and you don't have, like, you don't know how long you've been walking. It's just the mm -hmm. sun is a lot lower in the sky. It's been a few hours. Wow. Right? Feet hurt and your back hurts and you're tired and you're sweaty and, you know, you're hungry and you're wet and you're cold and you just kind of want to quit. And like, what are you going to do in that moment? Um, and And what you do is you ask somebody else if they need help. Right. Mm -hmm. Everybody recognizes that. Wow. You know, they, everybody realizes that dude, that's a guy that to me is irresistible. That's a guy I want on my right. team. I don't care anything else. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't care how smart he is. Like he's always right. thinking about somebody else and how can I help and how can I be there? Um, and, you know, uh, uh, there's a story in the Bible. Jesus talks about the woman who, who gave, who had two coins, right? And, and, and she gave, that was all she had, right? It was just two coins. It wasn't a lot, but but she gave from what she had. Um, and it meant a lot more than the guy who has a whole lot and gives very little. Um, and, and that's to me, those kinds of people are, they tend to attract. Uh, and that makes somebody irresistible when they ask a question and then they wait and they listen to your answer and they don't mm. feel like they have to share a story. And it's, it's, tell me about you, right? Let me okay. hear. And I'm going to ask questions about it. Cause I'm excited to hear your story. And, and what makes you great? And, and, you know, what can I learn from that? What, what do you have to teach me? And um, mm -hmm. I don't know, that's attractive to me. Right. Wow. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm debating if I should grab my notebook. I don't want to disturb the video. But like, I'm, like, I'm going to take a note on my phone, but like, you know, texting much. My, my mind, Jeremy, you have to take over because my mind is shot right now. It's just so much input and I'm, I don't know what to do with it. This is incredible. You know, like it, it's so true, and and it really just drive like it drives me into a conversation I had with a client this morning. Um, you know, my like we were talking about um, different different um, things that we want to take going into the new year and going into twenty twenty two. What are growths that we had over the last year, and what what where do we want to improve coming into twenty twenty two? 
And I was sharing, um, you know, I, I use a word called um, arrogance. And that's something that I personally wanted to work more on. And, you know, like at first my client kind of took this like step back and they're like, you're the least arrogant person I know. Literally, I quote them. And I said, well, you know, yeah, I mean, we all work on our ego and that that helps with being exceptional. That helps with being irresistible. And obviously we have to practice what we preach. But I found that there's this little hidden arrogance hidden underneath the surface. And, you know, we all have this pride that we've accomplished something and that we've done something. And th this thing is good. Like, it's good to be proud of something you've accomplished. But there could be this little hidden sort of like under the surface arrogance that's there. And it could sort of like just pop up at the least expected time. And I've discovered through a lot of meditation and a lot of like reflection that exactly what you said, um, Lewis, is so true and it hits true to me. It's that being of service and that giving over and that curiosity. I'm so interested in learning more about you. I'm so interested in getting to know you more. And I'm so interested in hearing what you have to say. On one hand, that curiosity is giving you a platform and giving you a stage to talk on and who doesn't like talking about themselves, right? And you make the other person feel good. And all of a sudden, you're the guy who's made to be that irresistible guy that everybody wants to be around, you know? So that to me was very interesting. And right before you respond to that, Lewis, I just want to take a quick second um, to invite all of our audiences that is now currently listening. I want to hear you guys as well. And Bark and I both want to hear you guys. Um, and we've we've created a special uh, space for that to be to be you know possible, and that's on Clubhouse. Um, we will be sharing the links tomorrow at seven p.m. same time as this as this show, um, where we want to hear what you guys have to say about the same topic. This is going to be your platform. It's going to be your time to be the hosts of this show, and we're very very interested in hearing everybody because I believe and Baruch believes and we all believe that everybody has a voice. So please stay tuned. Um, make sure to look out for links for our clubhouse group where you are invited to take part in this conversation. So Lewis, take it away with what are your thoughts about marrying, you know, that exceptionally irresistible, you know, discussion that we're having. Uh, I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw two wrenches into, into your discussion here, uh, oh. Jeremy, and, and hopefully I don't um, ruin your goals. Uh, but let, I, I want to, I want to encourage you on what you have seen as, as arrogance and, and tell you that a little bit of confidence, actually a lot of bit of confidence is very good. Now there's a really fine line between confidence and arrogance. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, but that's coming from somebody who probably oversteps it quite a bit. So, uh, <laughs> 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 um, but as a leader, you uh the the advice that i give one is you know um a couple things one is that i always ask um where am i wrong i i don't mm -hmm. ask uh i don't ask for you know i don't say um what do you think or um are there any problems with this mm -hmm. right i don't ask yes or no questions mm -hmm. i always whenever i come up with a plan or an idea i will ask the team um, how can this go wrong or where will this go wrong um, and push them and say, I, I don't need you to tell me that I'm right. I already think I'm right. That's why I'm bringing it to you. I think this is a great idea. I think we should do it. Right. So I'm coming to you to tell me why it's wrong um, and where, what I need to, what I need to change in this plan or whatever it is. Um, but what I have done with that is that I have, I have also portrayed confidence in that I'm, I'm confident with this decision. Right. Mm. Um, I'm confident I've had to make difficult decisions in the past. I once had to tell a team that we were going to climb a 10,000 foot mountain with 60 enemy on it that were in entrenched positions. And we had 11 guys and mm -hmm. I was going to go with them. And our 11 guys were going to climb up this mountain in the middle of the night and take on 60 guys. Okay. You wow. got to have confidence when you give that order. Sure. Yeah. 
the the face that Baruch just made right now, right? Like that's the I know the face. I saw it. It was like, what? don't worry, everybody made that face. Everybody, I made that face when I first got that mission, right? Wow. Um, but you got to have that confidence in delivering it. And so, uh, don't, don't sell yourself short and and think that your um, your just decision based on your experience is a sign of arrogance. Um, right. You know. So I would tell you, you know, be comfortable with that. Um, and then you mentioned the goal setting. Um, and I actually have a whole chapter in my book about uh, setting goals. And one of the problems with corporate goal setting that that kind of ticks me off. So it may not fall into this exceptionally irresistible. I apologize, but you brought it up and it gives me an opportunity to talk about oh, like good, the goals tick that I have is that we set 12 month goals. Just drives mm. me insane. These mm. small month goals. I literally had a manager one time tell me, you can't accomplish that in a year. So don't set it as a goal. Right. Right. So we're setting, we're setting goals that we think we can achieve. Uh, we're pretty confident that we can, we can set those goals. Um, so we're not really challenging ourselves. This is going back to that being mm. comfortable thing. Hmm. But what I would say is, and, and the chapter in the book is called crazy, scary goals. And that's the goals that I want to set. I don't want to set something that I, you know, I usually don't meet my goals wow. uh, and I'm disappointed. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, goal last year was to save 2 million bucks and, and I didn't make it. Okay. So this year it's, again, we're going to save $2 million. I'm going to save somebody $2 million, mm -hmm. uh, some business out there. And if you're listening to this and you think that's pretty cool. You know, I'd love to save two million bucks and it's about five percent of your total spend. Then let's have a chat and let's figure it out. And I'd love to meet that goal because then I'm gonna up it. But anyways, um I, I'm I would just love to be in a position where saving two million dollars <laughs> is like a big deal right now. <laughs> anyway, continue. I, I was literally thinking that right now. <laughs> I have to say it, it was bursting out. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> but we need to set those crazy scary ones. Mm -hmm. that the goals that keep you up at night, right? Like that right. thing. And you've had it before. Okay. I'm going to give you an example. And I know Jeremy's had, because I've talked to him about it the night before you proposed. Right. Did you sleep? Oh. <laughs> right. Okay. You had a crazy, scary goal and you mm -hmm. were going to move forward the next day and you didn't sleep that night because that right. goal that wow. you had set for yourself kept you from sleeping that night. How right. many other goals have we set that kept us the night before range of school? I didn't sleep at all. Right. Wow. I didn't, I, you, there was no sleep before that. Right. Like the, before these mm -hmm. big events, when I, you're like, okay, you talk to like these all stars, you know, the guys the night before the Super Bowl or whatever it is, before they reach that moment of, I'm going to make this happen. These, these big opportunities, uh, these once in a lifetime moments, these crazy, scary goals, Right before you get to that one, you know it's a crazy, scary goal because you ain't sleeping. You sure. know, because your mind is going through it and you're rehearsing it and you're thinking about it and what could go wrong and what should I do? Okay. And then I, I have, by the time I reach that event, I have played that event in my head, you know, 100,000 times. So Those true. are the goals we need to be setting. And we never set. Right. When I hear people say, um, oh, I haven't looked at my goals, right? Because you didn't mm -hmm. give a shit. I'm, excuse me, you know, but <laughs> it didn't matter, right? Like it wasn't. Right, yeah. It's was mm -hmm. just like an exercise and things, something that I had to do. And we're selling everyone short. We're selling right. our employees short. We're selling our business short. We're not letting people achieve the excellence that they can achieve because we're forcing them into these, oh, just do something that you can accomplish. Mm -hmm. No, let's set the thing that is, that feels impossible. This is, this is what Elon Musk does. Mm -hmm. right? He sets those goals that seem impossible and he misses them, but it, he got way far yeah. when he missed it. Right. Um, and that's what I feel like um, when it comes to like, if we're going to, if we're going to try and, and sit down and do real goal setting, let's do it, but let's make something like, let's think about where do we want this company to be in five or 10 years? Right. 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 What is, what does that look like? Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and then let's figure out how we get there you know, step by step. Um, but setting that goal, that's, that's, that's going to keep us awake. But you, you know, I go after it. Like, that's the thing. And that goes back to what you said before about the why is, you know, going getting yeah. through the challenges is that that goal has to be big enough and it has to be like you're saying crazy scary. And it, it has to be a big enough goal that it scares the pants off you, but there also has to be a strong why. And then you just have to go after it. Right. 
And I, I hear one more thing. I hear one more thing when I'm reflecting on what Lewis is saying. I hear be like, just be like, what's the right word? It's, it's being not excessive, but being like, just a, the right word is not coming, but like, be crazy about your dream. Okay. Like, like, yeah. like obsess about it. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Obsess about this dream. You know, because because you you really touched the point on the head when I was sharing you know my story on your on your podcast, where I set myself a goal that seemingly was impossible. At least people were telling me that this goal was impossible, and I remember you know the night before I was proposing that the goal that I set for my for myself was finding the right wife that was right for me, and in my circles people thought that woman doesn't exist. And when I did find her and I was about to propose to her that night before was, was, it was just so like, it was a scary time. It was, you know, that thing because it's like here, everybody told me this was impossible. I was obsessed by making it possible. I had trust and I had belief that I would reach it. And I just did everything in my power to reach it. And here I am the night before of the yes or no question this is literally the make it or break it. Like, is my dream going to come true or not? Like, that's where it is, you know? Um, and that obsession is what was keeping me up at night, you know? Um, that's what I'm hearing from what you're saying. Absolutely, man. You know, um, what one of the guys I, I recently interviewed for, for my <laughs> podcast, it ha, it actually, it will publish on Friday. He was a car salesman, the car salesman guy who owns 17 dealerships. So he wasn't a very good car salesman. He called his dad and he's like, yeah. hey, dad, I'm going to quit. And I'm going to come and, and run the store that you own. And dad said, you can quit, but you ain't running the store. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> he burned the ships on him. You know, yeah. this, is, this is the burning of the ships. You got, sure. you got no backup. Like you, you will make this, you will make this mm -hmm. thing happen. You know, uh, there's stories of, of, of like Tom Brady, who, um, and like one of his first practices told the coach or something like, I'm going to be your star quarterback. Coach was like, yeah, okay. you know, like, <laughs> right. Sure. Uh, I'm sure you will. You didn't even get drafted. Right. Like you, let's just focus on making the team right now, buddy, you right. know, not being, right. and, and, and look at him today. Right. Um, and it's, it's, I love when you said like what people told me it was impossible. That's when you know you're on the right track. Right. If somebody tells you, Hmm. That's that's probably not going to happen. Uh, that goal's that goal's too far, you know. Mm. Ah, now you got a good one. You got a good one when everybody thinks that it's crazy and nobody believes you, and everybody tells you like that's not going to happen. You're on the right track, unless you're five foot seven and you want to play in the NBA, right? Like then it's <laughs> then it's like just a matter of yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah. Um, I, I just want to ask you. Go ahead, go ahead, Mark. Sorry, go ahead. no, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll go if, if you insist. Um, I want to reflect back for a second about what you were saying previously about, you know, when you come to your team with where am I wrong with this? So that's something that I think is, mm -hmm. is important that it's, it's literally a lesson I just taught my students today. And then it is a lesson I had to implement for myself where it's okay to fail. It's okay to make mistakes. And on the contrary, you need to do that. Like we just implemented a, a new point system where they, for every period they can earn a coin which goes into a larger pot for the school, for the class to go on a trip. And they missed it on the second period. And I saw, showed them how use this as a way of reflecting on what do we do wrong? How do we fix it for mm -hmm. next time? And they used it. And then I kid you not, like two hours later, I was in the other class that I was working with. And there's one student who's a particularly difficult student. And they were really giving me a run for my money. And I was about to act and I acted in a certain way. And then I had to sit myself down on the like, okay, how did I act? What do I need to do differently? How do I fix this? And then I was able to proceed and, and fix it. And, you know, they ended the day off very well. But I think that's something that, like, um, a lot of people are scared of failure. But we have to understand yeah. that, that um, failing is okay and it's good. Making mistakes is okay. It's good. But that we can sometimes preempt our failure by plugging into the people around us and, and kind of seeing where are those holes that we need to, that, that we need to fill up. Um, that was just something I took away from what you had said there. I tell my kids there's two ways to learn. Uh, you can learn through listening or you can learn through pain. Uh, and, and I don't mean like I inflict pain on my children, but just that like if yeah. they don't listen, they're going to experience pain, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's up to you. You you, mm -hmm. you pick. I have chosen pain most of my life, right? Like that's how yeah. I have chosen to learn. Wow. Uh, and I hope that maybe I can 
ex, you know, share some of these lessons so others can learn by listening and not have to experience the pain themselves. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. And I think, I think that really, you know, wraps up this show in such a perfect way. You know, we did promise 40 minutes and we're 30 seconds over, but I just want to wrap it up and basically, you know, I did hear a lot of exceptionally irresistible golden nuggets coming from Lewis and, you know, Baruch, back me up if, if you think this is right. You know, this thing of like, of like what I was talking about, that hidden arrogance, right? Um, and, and how Lewis turned it around onto that assertive and that, um, that, you know, that confidence, right? Um, but I want to highlight something that Lewis said, which this is where I'm, I, I, hundred percent agree with him in the terms of there is a very fine line. There's a very fine line and the assertiveness can come across as aggressive as, you know, on LinkedIn, we're getting a, a comment from uh, Ronald Hunt and he's really saying it. And I'm, and I'm kind of like piggybacking on his, on his comment where that assertiveness could come across as aggressive. Mm -hmm. If we do not have the right, character or the right attitude or we're not coming from that exceptionally irresistible place if we do work on ourselves and we constantly grow in our exceptionally irresistibleness or whatever we call it then we come across more i would say confident in the right way that people could actually respond better and could actually go onto that mountain you know with with all those scary you know enemies and you're only a handful of people um, that's what I hear. And that's my takeaway when it comes to exceptionally irresistible. I'll tell you that the relationship matters. Um, and you know, if you have proven yourself over time, you can get away with a little bit more. Like my wife could just straight up tell me that's a terrible idea and then walk away. <laughs> right. And I know that like, she loves me and we've got a whole lot of, I've got to have a lot of experience and a lot of reasons to know that it's coming from a good place. Sure. Um, yeah. Whereas if one of you guys told me, I'd just be like, yeah, whatever. Like, I'm not going to listen to you. Right. And then we go from the irresistible to, I don't care about what you think anymore. Right. Um, right. Where you could still approach it from, you can, you can say, Hey, from my experience doing X, Y, Z, you know, based on what I know, I think maybe your approach could use some tweaks, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and just be based on where our relationship is, you know, like that's, that's probably how you would approach it. And that's probably why the line is so gray, right? Because it's different. Sure. On, you know, the messenger actually matters. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. To be fair, I thought we were at, at 45 minutes, not 40 minutes. So in my book, we still have an extra two minutes. Um, <laughs> I, I've got so many takeaways. The problem is they're all up here. So my the lesson I learned from today, aside from everything you've taught, is that next time I do need to have a pen and paper right next to me so I can be writing these things down because this this was absolutely mind-blowing, incredible. And there's so much, so much of it spoke to me and what I'm going through now. Um, I do want to encourage anybody watching. See, see there, there it is. Know. The yeah. man knows. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever um, you saw me looking down, that's what I was doing, my man. I wasn't sure, <laughs> but now I know. Wow. <laughs> so the, the last lesson that Lewis is leaving us is always have a pen and paper. Put that <laughs> yeah. out there. Write that down. Um, but before we wrap up, I do want to say um, to anybody watching, whether you're watching this live now, whether you're watching the recap. Um, Send in your, your takeaways. Send in what you learned. Connect with Lewis on any of the platforms that he's on. Um, Lewis, you're going to have to share with us where we can get your book and where we can find your, your podcast and all that stuff. Um, but definitely, everybody, follow up. Share your takeaways. I love learning from what other people learn from somebody who learned and taught. So that's my, that's my spiel. Uh, Keep On Landing can be found on Amazon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that. Of course. Um, I tried to I've, – I've, I've been leading teams for 20 years. And I have been through every leadership course that's out there, the three to five day seminar where you leave the office and you fall behind and then you get back to work on Monday and you have 700 emails and a bunch of fires and they've given you this thick notebook of takeaways of paper mm -hmm. and you can't execute any of it because the moment you get back, you got to go through email. So that ends up going in the drawer <laughs> up above your computer um, and you revert into bad habits that you had prior to that you had worked on while you were in class because now you're most those classes. I know how those go. Uh, I have some experience with them and I have put my own teams through them. Um, and a company pays three to five grand to put somebody through that torture right. and achieves absolutely nothing. So mm -hmm. I wanted to create 
um, a $10 version of an effective training manual. Uh, the chapters are short. You can usually read them in about 15 to 20 minutes. I did wow. that on purpose because the other thing I learned is that I did book studies with my junior leaders. I, I was a leader of leaders, right? So my team had, um, and I would do book studies and I would find that guys wouldn't try and read the chapter until they got the meeting reminder. So it's about 15 minutes. So that was kind of like my goal. Like, can I read this in 15 minutes? Because like if somebody's sitting there, they got a meeting. Oh, shoot, I got to go read this chapter for my meeting that's in 15 minutes, right? Um, and then at the end, there's like a, a, a literal box that says, here's the action that you need to take. Um, so Love if it. you lead a team, everybody can go read it. They'll read a chapter a week and then there's an action. So you have like, we're all going to work on this one thing. Um, and it's not disruptive. It's something that you can continue to work on and you build on. And most of the lessons will build on previous ones as well. So it's kind of like set up as a training course. You can read it as just by yourself. Um, you can read it as a team. You can do it as a whole corporation and, you know, buy a hundred copies. I would love that. Uh, and you can, you know, teach all your leaders and I would be happy to help further with that as well. Amazing. Just throw that out there if somebody wants to do that. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, let's keep on leading. And the podcast is called Build with Grit. Uh, and that's on YouTube. Um, and, uh, you know, you can share that through Yermi's, uh, Yermi's uh, mm -hmm. guest appearance. So I think he's got the link to that. Mm -hmm. and he could share that. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and it's come a little ways from there, but it's not what you guys have here. I mean, this is legit. So, you know, <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. This is episode one. I'm Thanks. like, I don't even know what episode I'm on. Uh, I'm not yeah. here. So well done, y'all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So yeah, that does wrap up our show. Um, I will be sharing on my LinkedIn and Barak will be sharing on his LinkedIn, the show notes to this show um, as a recap. Um, and in those show notes, we are going to have the links to all what we've spoken about. Um, you know, you could contact um, Lewis through the, through that, through that show note um, article that we're going to be posting. And this was just such an incredible, incredible time. And really, you know, Lewis, first of all, thank you so much for yeah. coming on here, bringing so much value. Um, I know that so many people have taken so much takeaways here. And once again, I just want to remind all the audience here, you guys have a voice as well. And we really want to hear it. And we really invite you onto the clubhouse. We're going to be sharing the links. We're going to be sharing all the information, how to get there. And if you want, you could also search on clubhouse the Exceptional Irresistible Show. Um, we do have it planned for tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And we want to hear what you guys have to say. What is, you know, what is exceptional? What is irresistible? What is exceptionally irresistible? If you guys want to share your takeaways from stuff that you've learned from the amazing guest that we had here, I'm so glad he was a secret until he showed up. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> this was this was awesome. And we really want to hear you all. And thank you guys so much for tuning in and for listening and for being part of this awesome community. So at least on my behalf, you know, thank you all for joining. You heard me said it all. Thank you all. Thanks for having all me. Right. It was my See pleasure. you guys. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>